everyone. Welcome to the podcast. This is Jill. Memory is a treasure and the guardian of all things, Cicero. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about building memory. The last episode, we talked about how to learn new things. But one of the key parts about learning something is memory on both ends of it. First, you have to memorize certain aspects to learn something new. But then once you've learned something new, it needs to stay in your memory full time. So now we're going to talk a little bit about what is memory and how can we memorize things easier. So the first thing to know about memory is that there are a few different kinds of memory. There's declarative memory, and that means just pulling out facts. It happened on this date. It happened in this location. It's very straightforward. Then there's recognition. Oh, I've seen that thing before. I've seen that person before. I remember them. You might not know a lot of details about them, but you at least acknowledge that you have seen this person or this thing or this concept before. Recall is just dredging up memory so that we're pulling it out of the vast storages of our brain and trying to get it out so that we can use the memory. Procedural memory is about remembering processes. This is where I actually come in. I am terrible at declarative memory. This happened on this date and this happened in this location. I can't remember it. As soon as you put it in part of a procedure or a process, I will remember it forever. Putting facts into a story is procedural memory because now you've made it part of a process. So now instead of these random raw facts that I could never remember in a million years with a story built around it, I can remember it forever. So I have great procedural memory. Psychology Today lists their types of memory in a little bit different framework than that list of memories. Episodic memory. And that's when someone is able to remember something in a series of things. I wonder if that's similar to the procedural memory. But, you know, first they went here and then they went there and then they did that. It says that it's what a person recalls at a particular event or episode. So that means the emotions that were there, the surrounding that was there, the noises that were there, episodic memory. Then there's semantic memory, and that's a long-term store of knowledge. And that just has to do with definitions. And then it's like all the different facts of things. One may remember the details of a party, what date it was. Procedural memory is basically a memory of how to do things, either mentally or physically. That means that you remember how to ride a bike. You remember how to sail on a boat and you remember how to tie your shoes. These are all things that we go through step by step. And that's a procedural memory that you have. Then there's short term memory and working memory. And the Psychology Today article suggests that those are sometimes used interchangeably. Working memory is something that is right there. And so we're listening to a lecture and he'll say, so just remember that a beetle is a bug. You're like, okay, a beetle is a bug. And then he'll say, bugs tend to have these characteristics. It's not in your deep memory yet. You're just listening to a lecture. But that working memory is you're sort of storing it in a close place so that you can use it right away. Think about when you're cooking and you chop up little bowls of onions and mushrooms and you put them in little tiny bowls in front of you so that you're readily able to use them as you're cooking your meal. That's what working memory is. Short term memory is maybe like a new acquaintance, someone you just met. Don't forget to go get the thing out of your car right away. So even though they're a little bit similar, they do have some distinct characteristics that are different from each other. So the example of Psychology Today article gave is that short-term memory is remembering someone you just met, whatever the current temperature is, what happened in a movie you saw a moment ago. But working memory is something that you calculated as part of a math problem. So you're trying to figure out a tip and you say, okay, so the meal came to $100. That's the working memory. Or a working memory, they said, is whoever was named at the beginning of a sentence. Bob went to the store. Wait, who went to the store? Bob did. Okay, that's working memory. Then they call it sensory memory. And sensory memory is a lot of stimulus, sounds and noises and smells and anything that you use to your senses. You hear people tell stories where they'll say, oh, it was a beautiful day. I could hear the birds chirping. That's sensory memory. I think uh, some people are really attuned to certain senses. And so some people are great at remembering smells, while other people are great at remembering what music was playing at that time. Then they say there's prospective memory, and they call that forward thinking memory. So that means that you're trying to recall something from the past in order so that you can do something in the future. 
So I'm going to get in my car and now I have to remember, well, first I turn the keys, then I'll lock the door, then I'll put my seatbelt on. So you're dredging up a prospective memory quickly so that you can put it into action so you know how to drive the car. Or maybe it's how to drive home from work, or maybe it's how to walk to the local library. It's a quick memory that you're recalling so that you can make use of it. And so those are the memory types that Psychology Today mentions in their article. Some things that we do know about memory is they talk about attention, that we have to know when we're trying to remember something, what it is we have to pay attention to. At any given moment, we have a ton of things coming at us. Even right now, as I'm recording this podcast, I hear my cats out in the hallway. The software is running that's recording this podcast. I'm looking at my notes and I'm also trying to think about what my tone of my voice is. All sorts of things going on. Same thing when you're trying to learn something in a classroom. The window's open over there. The professor's talking in front of you. The people behind you are talking. Being able to focus your attention and pay attention to the right thing, that's the first step when it comes to both learning and improving your memory. And then there's this concept of elaboration, which means that you create these ties to it. So you're listening to a lecture and the person is talking about the history of literature. And they say something like, this is Greek mythology and people read it as classical literature. And so now when you're trying to remember this, you're thinking about Greece, you're thinking about Athens, you're trying to tie it back into your memory. So you're pulling all these things in to try to elaborate whatever is being said or taught to you so that it creates ties in your brain. So Jim Quick, if you don't know him, is an expert on the mental game of almost everything. He's great about learning new things, mental tricks on how to memorize things. And he really gives a lot of his time to trying to help people to better their brain power. And he's written a number of books and a lot of them are very good. So if you're interested in this kind of thing, I'll have those listed in my show notes at smallsteppod.com. So first of all, he talks about when you're trying to remember things, you try to remember his acronym called MOM. The funny thing about Jim Quick is, is every time he tells you to remember something for your own good, it always is a mnemonic. He's always trying to follow his best advice. So mom stands for M for motivation. And he said that a lot of times our problems with memory have to do with motivation. And he suggests that if there was a suitcase next to you with $100,000 in it, and all you had to do was remember the name of the next person you met, you'd probably do it because that motivation is there. A lot of times when we won't remember something or we say, oh, I'm really terrible at names because you're not very motivated to learn that name. So motivation is everything. That has nothing to do with capability. It has nothing to do with your age. It has nothing to do with how good your memory is. It has everything to do with how much we care that we learn the thing that we're trying to learn. So he suggests if you have struggles remembering someone's name and then you meet somebody new, ask yourself, why do I want to remember that person's name? And so you remember it because you gave yourself that reason or that million dollar suitcase in front of you so that you would learn it. The O in mom stands for observation. So how are you going to learn this thing? You know, in the case of an introduction, someone's going to introduce you to Barb and you're going to remember it. In cases of other things you have to remember, a speech or something that you're trying to learn, what method are you going to use to learn it? And then the last M in mom is mechanic. What technique are you going to use to try to remember this thing? But some of them are the memory palace, chain linking, and rewarding yourself for actually pulling off remembering things. If you reward yourself when you actually succeed at something, it'll be more likely that you will succeed in the future. He suggests a challenge that you should have a friend, a spouse, a roommate, someone close to you. Every day, you each give each other 10 words to remember or 10 concepts to remember. And then you challenge each other at the end of the day to see if you remembered them. Practice makes you better. Practice, as we learned in the last podcast, When you learn something, it actually changes the structure of your brain. You become better at learning something the next time. Same thing with memory. As you remember things and then you recall it, your memory gets better too. Not just on the thing you memorized, but on everything. And then the other question he says is that distraction is bad. 
that as we distract ourselves with our phones and our iPads and our computers and the television and the squirrel over there, it makes it impossible for us to learn things. What's interesting is in the book we talked about last time, How We Learn, he said distraction wasn't bad because it is going to make us learn things that we can dredge up out of our memory in the real world. When we go to the real world, there's going to be TVs and computers and phones. And so as we learn things in the position that we memorize them in, if we vary that and we have all sorts of distractions, it helps us to learn. Jim Quick thinks that distractions are terrible for our memory and that it makes it impossible to learn things. So that's an argument there between distractions or not distractions. I find distractions helpful to me. Perhaps you don't. So I think this is a case where you have to know you. So the technique that we talked about first was memory palace. And the memory palace is a really interesting thing. And so what he does is a strategy for memorizing things is you put everything into a story. And it is an absolutely silly story. So the first thing that you do when you're trying to do that is let's say that I'm trying to memorize a grocery list. So I want to buy lettuce, eggs, fish, flour, sugar, and coffee. Okay, so those are six random things that I want to remember. So what you would do is you would, first of all, come up with these very vivid image of these things. You know, so it's not just an egg. It is a six pound egg, a giant egg, the size of what you think a dinosaur would lay. And when you're looking at the fish, the fish is colorful and full of pink and green speckles. You know, so you take those individual items and you blow them up into a big imagery. Then the second thing that you do is you put them in a particular location. So in this article that talks about it, the researcher who looked into it said, the weirder, the better. So he talks about making this memory in a bizarre location. So you could say something like, I was walking through a gigantic lettuce patch. And in the middle of the lettuce patch was this enormous pink egg. And when I cracked open the enormous pink egg, I saw pink and green speckled fish and I took them out of there and I decided to dry them off with flour, hoping that that would get rid of all the slimy stuff that was inside the egg. And what happened was the suddenly the fish became sugar and they turned into little pink and green sugar cubes. And then I ended up putting into my giant cup of coffee that I brought with me on my hike. I might not be that great at it, but you can kind of see how that went. So now as you remember the story to somehow get you to remember the thing. And again, he says, the crazier, the better. Then he says that what you should do is pay attention and keep repeating to yourself this mantra. I want to memorize this. I want to memorize this. And then keep doing that because if you make up this goofy story and then you're not really paying attention to it, it won't help you in remembering it. So you have to make sure that as you're creating the story that you make sure that you pay attention. And then he talks about if it's a very large group of items, you have to make sure that you break it up into chunks. Learning podcasts, we talked about chunking, breaking things up into smaller bits like phone numbers. I gave myself a relatively short list that were here, but imagine if this was a 50 item grocery list. So maybe I'd want to chunk it up by the aisles that these things are actually in. So I would have a dairy story. I would have a vegetable story and so on. So being able to break your story up into smaller pieces will help you remember it. And then he said, review it. Make sure that you can go through that same story again. And if you are able to then spit that story out and successfully get that list out, then you got it. You've learned it. The next thing that they talk about is chain linking memories. And chain linking memories means that you will remember a list by putting two pieces of things together. Let's take a look at my six item list that I said about grocery shopping. You would say I need to buy lettuce eggs, eggs, fish, fish flour, flour, sugar and sugar coffee. It makes it easier to remember because now you've paired things together. And so if you forget one thing, the other piece of it will help you remember it. And it's even easier that if you can somehow categorize them together, that'll make it even better. So I think the sugar coffee and the flour sugar make some sense together because they're always put sugar in coffee and you always have flour and sugar. So that helps make it even better. So even if you can make it a little bit more interesting of how you chain these things together, the easier it will be to remember those things. 
And then the next thing is called peg listing. And peg listing has to do with associating a list of items with something that you already know and would never forget. The 10 fingers on your hands, the alphabet A to Z, counting 1 to 20, those are all things that you will never, ever forget. So what you do is you assign essentially a thing to each finger. I have a friend who does that. She she has a really interesting technique, but she will give each finger a thing. And so you can see her when she's trying to remember something going through her fingers. Or you'll say A is for apple, L is for lettuce, and you'll go through the alphabet by putting the things you want to remember in the list into something you know. So you would say A is for apple, B is for banana, C is for capons, D is for dog food, E is for eggs. And so you would keep that list by tagging it to something that you already know. I did it so that the letter actually matched the things. You don't necessarily have to do it that way. But I think, too, if you can do it that way, it makes it easier, although it may make your grocery shopping a little confusing. So these are some examples that were in Jim Quick's book, but also on a website that talked about memory strategies that, again, will be listed in my show notes. And so the next step is, is chunking. You want to break things into smaller groups. We mentioned that as part of one of the techniques that's there, but chunking in memory can help you break things up into smaller pieces. Just putting it into things like the phone number, that's one step. But there's some other ways that you can chunk memory up so that it makes sense. Try and remember your points for a debate. You can say pros or cons. Or maybe it's a theory, it's evidence, and it's reasons. Or if this is a process, step by step. So as I was trying to put my snowblower together, first goes the handle, then goes the chute, then goes the gas, then goes the chain. And so you're doing it step by step because it makes logical sense. And then the last method they talk about is the hamburger method. And that means that you sort of put all the facts or all the things in somewhat of a hamburger. You could probably even use it as a grocery store list. So the first thing is the bun, the top bun. What are those items? Then comes the next layer or the supporting details. And that's going to be the tomato or the vegetable layer. Then the meat layer, then the other vegetable layer, and then the other bun. And so what you're doing is you're just basically putting things into a category of something that's recognizable to you. So those are some quick techniques helping you to review things. One thing is that when you remember something, it's because it has special value to you. A little bit about what Jim Quick was talking about when it comes to motivation. But it's even beyond that. He mentions that if you ever got into a car accident, you would probably remember every detail of that. But you may not even remember what it is you had for dinner last night. And that's because one thing was exceptional and rare and the other thing was mundane. And so it's harder to get mundane things stored in your long-term memory. And so that way, as much as you can make something an experience, you'll be able to remember it better. And there are things that I remember just because they were such unique experiences. And I want to remember these things time and time again. Being able to Build that as a unique experience, using your visualization skills, remembering it as it looked, remembering what it smelled like and it sounded like. Those will help make those things more unique and vital to us that will make it easier for us to remember. So he says in this website that always have in mind the basic rule, unique experience plus strong association equals increased memory capacity. That's where you want to make something unique with strong associations. Summary, keep in mind, when you need to remember something, you have to have motivation to remember it. Ask yourself, why am I remembering it? Two, figure out how you're going to learn or memorize this thing. Three, what type of technique are you going to use? The memory palace, the chain linking, the peg listing, whatever it is, what are you going to do in order to learn this thing better? Four. Come up with a reward strategy so that if you do start remembering people's names, maybe you get an extra treat at the conference. Make sure you reward yourself. Five, come up with a mechanic that you're going to use to help you remember things. That might be memory palace, chain linking, peg listing, chunking things up in shorter bits. Six, always remember that unique experiences with strong associations tied to them will always help you in recalling things when it's tough. Challenge. 
I think I'm going to jump on the back of Jim Quick's challenge and say, find one person who you can spend time with, hopefully every day, that you can each challenge yourself to remember 10 different things. So in the morning, you each give yourself 10 objects, and then you recite them back to each other at the end of the day. That's a great challenge from an expert on memory. So try that out. And now for our fun quote of the day. And this comes from the TV show on Disney Plus called WandaVision. No, no, there on the calendar, someone's drawn a little heart right above today's day. Oh, yes, the heart. Oh. <laughs> well, don't tell me you have forgotten, Viz. Forgotten? A wonder I'm incapable of forgetfulness. I remember everything. That's not an exaggeration. In fact, I'm incapable of exaggeration. Well, then tell me what's so important about today's date. And if you've never seen that show and you like Marvel things, that is an interesting place to go. Boy, it'd be nice if we were incapable of forgetfulness and that we could remember everything. I wonder if that would make our lives better. I suspect it will make our lives worse. I remember a time when we had a community online and a message board where the people kept fighting with each other all the time. And what would happen is the software we used was so terrible that eventually the whole message board would break and we would have to go to a brand new message board. And you know what? In some ways, all the old fights and all the old arguments went away as soon as the message board broke, cleaned out all the rafters, and suddenly people were able to forgive each other. I wonder at some times if the internet being such a great memory tool is maybe the thing that's tearing us apart because we can go back to when you're three and a half years old and figure out what that awful thing you said to us was when normally you would have just forgotten it. All right, but that's Vision on his amazing memory. I want to thank everyone for listening. I appreciate all of you out there. I know that you're leaving reviews, that you're telling your friends about this podcast, or you're sharing it with someone who you think might be interested in it. Please let me know at smallstepspod.com if there's something that you want to talk about or you have a question about anything on the show. Have a great week. <laughs>